I'm pretty tired. I think I'm gonna go home now. Although with that view, I should probably do part three of my R7 review. I spent the last 300 miles thinking of that dad joke. Welcome to Kevin Deal Photography, where I take you on my journey through photography. On today's episode, we're going to be doing part three of our Canon R7 review. If you missed part one, I talked about very basics of the Canon R7. I talked about my initial impressions. I did an unboxing and then I went ahead and took it along on a portrait shoot. I'll leave a link in the description down below if you want to check it out. On part two, we took a deeper dive into the high performance of the camera. We did sports, we did wildlife, we did an ISO test in the studio. We also tested out how the camera performed with different SD cards. On part three, we're gonna take the R7 out on an adventure to the American Southwest where we're gonna test it out on landscapes. We're gonna see how different lenses work uh, in the wide end, on the long end, and see how it works with that 1.6 crop factor. I'm also gonna take it on the streets of Las Vegas where we're gonna test it out on street photography, see how it works as a vacation lens. Uh, and then we're also going to end the episode out with a wedding. We're gonna see how the various lenses and various scenarios work with the R7. And uh, hopefully that will give some insight to maybe some of you potential wedding photographers out there. But I don't wanna keep yapping. Let's go ahead and start our adventure right now. My first stop on my Southwest journey was Amarillo. For those of you who don't know, you can drive an entire day and still be in the state of Texas. It's kind of a big state. So I decided to make a stop off Route 66 and shoot some video on my R7. Cadillac Ranch is an anomaly in the otherwise milk toast landscape that Amarillo has to offer. It was a collaboration between some San Francisco hippies and a local billionaire in the mid-1970s. It's a living and breathing art installation that's constantly changing as more and more people apply spray paint to it. It's basically the backs of 10 Cadillacs slanted toward the West. Over the years, people have defaced the cars and vandalized it, and it's actually become a focal point of the installation itself. And this is why you see kids jumping all over the cars and spray painting them. Ironically, there's a sign saying that you shouldn't vandalize outside of the installation. Somehow, I don't think they enforce it. But hey, at least it was able to provide me with some well-lit situations where I could test out my R7 for video. But I know a lot of you are wondering about poorly lit situations. So let's do a noise test for video. We're going to do a noise test in my hotel room. Uh, we're going to start at 1600 ISO. We are shooting in 4K fine. Uh, IPB 23.97 frames per second. Uh, we're starting at 1600 ISO. Uh, you can look at the shadow detail and the walls and tell me if that's going to work for you. We're at 3200 ISO. Once again, poorly lit room, shadow detail. Tell me what you think. Is this going to work for you? We're now at 6400 ISO. What are you thinking on these shadow details? Too noisy? You tell me. All right, now 12,800. We've capped out the ISO on the camera. We can't go any higher than this. So you tell me, in poorly lit situations, does the R7 get the job done for you? For the lens today, we've used the RF 35mm f1.8. I haven't been on a proper vacation since 2019, and I was dying to get out of Texas. So I sought refuge. The mercury was north of 100 degrees in most of the country while I was on this trip, but one place where I was sure to get relief from the scorching hot temperatures, the mountains of Colorado. I slapped on my 28 to 70 and got some shots in the Pike National Forest. And if you're not familiar with the area, it rains pretty much every day in the afternoon. So the weather ceiling was tested and I'm happy to report the R7 passed with flying colors.
I even took it up to 14,000 feet to the summit of Pikes Peak, and I'm happy to report nothing but great pictures. The mountains of Colorado proved to be a target-rich environment for 120 frames per second ultra slow motion. However, I did promise this video to be a tour of the American Southwest, which this part of Colorado is not. Good morning to all of you. I'm coming to you from the Mittens here at Monument Valley, the world famous Mittens. Uh, word of the wise, if you want to get here in the summer when it's not 108, get here when they open at 7 a.m. Uh, but today, we're gonna see how the R7 works for landscapes. I know a lot of you are seeing this 28 to 70 attached to it, and you're probably thinking, well, this isn't gonna help me much because I bought this because I'm on a budget. Don't worry, I'm gonna take some shots with the 28 to 70. I'm gonna take some shots with the 24 to 105. I just happen to be filming with it right now. Uh, and then I will put the data in the pictures when I post them, so that way you know which lens I was using. Due to a busy itinerary, we ended up going in the morning, which isn't the ideal time to get the famous shot of the mittens. One common dilemma for landscape photographers is, is the lens you're bringing wide enough? Is the lens you're bringing long enough? Now, take a 1.6 crop factor into consideration, and it changes things completely. So, I'm going to test some various lenses out, and we're going to see if they're wide enough or if they're long enough for this 1.6 crop factor on the R7. So I got the R7, I'm doing 14 millimeter. I think I comes with like 22.5 when you convert the crop factor into it. So let's see what kind of shots we can get of John Ford's point here, which is where a lot of famous Westerns like Stagecoach and uh, you've actually seen Forrest Gump filmed here. You've seen um, some Mission Impossible movie filmed here. So let's see what kind of shots we can get. 14. I'm at f11, it says I'm underexposing, so I'm gonna raise my ISO. There we go, 14. Kind of wide, honestly. Let me zoom in. Actually, let me get a good foreground element. Beautiful. If you're gonna do Monument Valley, John Ford Point is a must, and it's gonna be friendly to all of your lenses. I took advantage of the beauty of Monument Valley to test out the time lapse capabilities of the R7. And I know you don't come to this channel for travel advice, but to me, Monument Valley is one of the greatest places to photograph on the entire planet Earth. So we are here at Horseshoe Bend near Lake Powell and Page, Arizona, and we're gonna be doing a test to see how well the R7 handles landscapes. A lot of people who shoot landscapes want to go wide, so uh, with the 1.6 crop factor we're going to test out how wide it gets. We're going to be using the 14 to 35 at 14 millimeter, uh, we're going to be using the 24 to 105 at 24 millimeter, and the 28 to 70 at 28 millimeter. Now, if you are at home and you're like, man, I can't afford any, any of those three lenses, that's okay, we're going to use the 16 millimeter 2.8 STM as well. So I got a treat for you who are on a budget and we'll just see how wide uh, this camera can go and how good it is for landscapes. Horseshoe Bend is a very common tourist place. As a matter of fact, I got there during sunset when there were a bunch of tourists there. So 
don't judge me based off these shots. There's people in them. I didn't go at the ideal time to take really great landscapes, but I did bring my various lenses to see which ones were wide enough to get this very common shot that many of you have taken before. So this should give you a good basis as to which lenses will work really well with the R7 for shots like Horseshoe Bend. The 28 to 70 and the 24 to 105 just couldn't get wide enough with the 1.6 crop factor. This was one of the few shots where a full frame would have made a lot more sense and it really pushed the limits of a crop sensor. But the 14 to 35 and the 16 millimeter did really well at Horseshoe Bend. So we are uh, gonna test out the R7 here at the Grand Canyon with the South Rim, Maricopa Point. And uh, I'm gonna use both the 14 to 35 and the 16 millimeter. We're gonna see how wide they are and how they work. So as I was getting ready to do the test, I saw a helicopter flying over. People pay copious amounts of money to take helicopter tours in this mile deep hole in the ground. Thought it was a good opportunity to test the tracking out for the 120 frame per second high frame rate. I thought it did pretty good considering there's a lot of distractions behind the helicopter. But anyway, let's get back to the test. I intended to bring both the 14 to 35 and the 16 2.8 to show off the wide end, but I had limited space in my bag and I had to ride a bus. So therefore I opted for the 24 to 105 and the 16 millimeter, and I'll show you the results of both. I'll also throw in some of my telephoto work as well, just so you can see the long end. Seriously, if you've never been to the Grand Canyon, just go. Because we took the buses at Grand Canyon, I had a limited amount of space in my bag. As a result, 105 millimeters was the longest I took in the bag. But I brought a 135 on the trip. So we went to Valley of Fire State Park. We got some really cool shots at 135 millimeters. I thought it compressed really well. I thought that long telephoto looked great with this cool shot of the road, but it was over 110 degrees and it was several straight days of landscapes and it was time to get back to some humanity. As much as I love nature and landscapes, it was time to get away. So we found ourselves driving to fabulous Las Vegas. I wanted to be around more people and people watching and find me a better city for people watching and street photography than Sin City. The ability to go into the air conditioning or go into a pool was very appealing, but it was still very hot there, which led me to my next test. Two cool things about the R7 is that they removed the recording limits on it. And they also apparently overcame the issue with the overheating while recording in 4K. We're gonna put that to the test today because we're in Las Vegas where it's about 112 degrees. And I'm just gonna put this guy on a tripod. I'm gonna record him in the most demanding 4K mode, the 4K 60 frames per second IPB. And we'll see how long it'll go before it tells me that it needs to start shutting down due to overheating. Uh, they do have a really cool meter on the camera now that tells you how hot it is. I'm gonna go uh, hang out in the pool. I'm just gonna put this guy in a tripod and just see how long he goes before he starts giving me issues. I didn't exactly choose portfolio material to conduct my test with. I simply recorded the rules on the wall of the pool that I'm currently drinking beer at and getting cool in. I'm not gonna bore you in real time, so let's go ahead and fast forward the video. All right, so we're 10 minutes in. No heat warning. Time for a beer. So we're about 28 minutes in, 28 and a half minutes in. I'm seeing that the temperature gauge is at about half, uh, which isn't that big of a deal. Uh, but yeah, we're almost at that 30 minute recording limit. Yeah, we're at almost 35 minutes and we are at the last bar before this thing shuts down. 
So let's see if we can make it to 35. All right, we made it to 35 minutes. Uh, but my heat warning is going off, so I'm gonna shut this thing down at 35 minutes. Uh, because, hey, I love this camera, and I never, ever intend to record it in these kinds of conditions ever again. I'm just doing this test for all of you, because I love you. All right, so we took the R7 to the limit. We got about 35 minutes out of it. It's the middle of July, 112 degrees, 4 p.m. Yes, I am in the shade. I don't want to push my equipment to the point where I destroy it, so I did put it in the shade. Um, I got 35 minutes before the warning indicator started kicking in. I didn't want to see what happened after that because I do intend to use this camera long term. But I would imagine 99.9% .9 of you who are watching this right now are never going to push your camera as hot as this in these kinds of conditions. But some of you will. Uh, so I just wanted you to see what 4K 60 frames per second would do with the R7. Yeah, it's gonna work for me, but maybe your expectations are higher. Maybe you're shooting in Dubai and you need something that goes three hours continuous with, uh, with no overheat. But this is definitely an improvement on the R5 and the R6. Without question, uh, most of you are not gonna be shooting in Nevada, in Las Vegas, in the middle of the summer, in the middle of July, at 4 p.m. with this thing. So uh, I personally don't shoot longer than 10 minutes at a time when I'm doing YouTube stuff anyway, because they're just short segments. It definitely does great in the heat test and I have no worries moving forward. So I took my R7 back up to the hotel room, which was pretty darn hot to the touch. I let it cool down and then I put a fresh battery in it. Then we headed to Fremont Street where I finally got to use my 35 1.8, which is my trusty street photography lens. A lot of people aren't hip to Fremont Street. Most people go to the strip and they walk those gigantic quarter mile long blocks. If you're into something that requires a little less walking where you're a little bit more on top of things, Fremont is the way to go. Fremont is the old strip. It has so many really cool old casinos. I'm not much of a gambler to be honest. I'm more into people watching when I'm in Las Vegas and there's no better place for people watching than Fremont Street. This is where you'll find a plethora of characters, street performers, uh, people just participating in debauchery, drinking alcohol, having fun with their cannabis. This is the place to document it. And some of these characters have been working Fremont Street for a really long time. For instance, check out this marionettist right here. This guy right here, I actually took pictures of this guy in 2017 with my original 7D. He's been working this place that long. I could spot that unmistakable slash from Guns N' Roses top hat from a mile away. Anyway, it's pretty cool that he was able to afford a Pelican case for his puppets now. Those tips are paying off. gone are the days of your grandfather's Las Vegas Strip. Dean Martin, Frank Sinatra, those names are now street signs. Tributes to the old Las Vegas. The new Las Vegas is the Chainsmokers, Adele, John Legend. The focal point is still entertainment, and there are some traditional Las Vegas acts that have held on, like Wayne Newton. I used the 35 1.8 on my R7 when I went to Fremont Street, but for the main strip, I brought in the heavy hitters. I'm gonna use my RF 28 to 70 F2, paired up with my RF 24 to 105 F4. I think this video has demonstrated that the R7 does an admirable job for vacation, landscapes, street, and video. However, how good is the R7 at weddings? The 
R7 was relegated to second shooter duty for this wedding, I used my R5 and my GFX 100S during the ceremony and during the couple's portraits, but in parts one and two of this video, I've proven that the camera can do great on portraits, I've proven that the camera can do great in fast-paced situations, so we can conclude that the R7 will do just fine during the ceremony and during the couple's portraits. I mean, just look at these portraits right here. I think they look fantastic. There were a lot of things that required me to be on my toes, and I only had the R7 for a mere six days. But those infamous Canon ergonomics came through in the end. Even though I didn't use the R7 during the ceremony, I still wanted to use it during critical moments of the day, like the bouquet toss, the convocation, the speech of the best man, the maid of honor speech, the father of the bride, and finally, the grand exit. So you tell me, does this camera do well at weddings? Does it tell the story of the day? Based on what I'm looking at right now, I have to say yes. Today is the 23rd of July. It's the one month anniversary of me picking up my R7. So now that I've spent a month with it, and I've also taken it over 4,000 miles. And all of you who are watching this right now and have watched parts one and two of this review as well have spent about an hour with me. So I'm going to give you my thoughts uh, and hopefully you'll have some more of your own uh, having gone through three parts of this review. Uh, I'm telling you right now, the autofocusing on this is as good, if not better than my R5. And no, I'm not you know, being paid by anybody to say that it, it is better than my R5. Um, and most most scenarios, it, it borrows from the R3. So why wouldn't it be better than the R5? Uh, something that I love on this camera um, that all Canon cameras are doing these days, which is when you turn it off on mechanical shutter, the curtain goes down. My Fuji GFX, which costs uh, four times more than this camera, doesn't have it. I think all cameras should have the curtain that, that goes over it. The build quality is great. The weather ceiling was great. Um, the buffer and all that to me was fine. For some of you, I've seen some people in the comments saying that they're disappointed about the buffer. I wasn't disappointed about the buffer, but I'm also not a wildlife photographer. I'm a portrait photographer. I would absolutely take this on vacation. It absolutely meets that standard and exceeds that standard. I could leave my R5 at home. Uh, for those of you who are worried about the new dial, I can tell you that I've been using it alongside my R5 and I actually uh, prefer this dial because your exposure triangle, you've got your aperture here. I have my shutter speed right here. And then I reprogrammed my record button to be my ISO. So I have my exposure triangle here, here, and here and they're all really close to one another. I know a lot of you are waiting right now for your R7s uh, and I just figured since I had one and I got one on the release date uh, that I would put a review together and maybe those of you who are waiting for that UPS guy to come to your front door uh, anxiously, uh, hopefully my review will get you a little bit more excited and you have every reason to be excited because the R7, I think Canon is gonna sell a ton of these I don't really pay attention to camera sales, but I have a feeling that the R7, if you look at a list at the end of the year, is going to be toward the top of the APS-C sales. So this concludes part three of my R7 review. I want to thank all of you who took the time to watch this video, including those of you who watched the first two videos. I really do thank you. Uh, your comments helped fuel what I decided to pursue in part three. So thank you for those comments. If you have anything else you want to talk about, tell me in the comments below. How are you using your R7? Tell me in the comments below. Has your R7 even shown up? I'm so sorry to say that. Tell me in the comments below. If you find this channel useful, click the subscribe button below. 
I do appreciate your support. I really do think this is the best APS-C camera on the market to date. Yes, that means even better than the Fuji cameras that are out there. The autofocusing on this is simply superior, and so are the lenses. Until next time, I'll talk to you soon. Bye. Thank you.